Alrighty, I'll just wait until I see that the recording has started. All right, welcome everyone. It's lovely to see um, uh, students and um, colleagues and guests with us today. I'm so pleased to welcome you to this conversation about miniature painting and contemporary art with Tazine Kayam. So we are very privileged to hear from Tazine, an internationally recogni recognized intermediate artist, originally from Pakistan, now living in Toronto. Um, and she will talk a lot about the varied traditions of miniature painting and how this influences her work. Her work is an example behind her um, that you see on her webcam. Uh, so incorporates calligraphic text, fig figural imagery, and also conceptual forms. So she is also a live performance artist, and hopefully she'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, and a lot of her work is very relevant to the concerns about social conflict, displacement, and identity. So she directly supports the artist community in Canada um, through a uh, an organization called Art Address. So we're so privileged to have her in the Celebration of Islam Through Art series. And please, Tazeen, take it away. We're excited to hear from you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Leah. And thanks to UTA for giving me this opportunity to present. And uh, I'd like to thank everybody who's joining us today uh, and taking the time out. So uh, basically, in today's presentation, I will briefly um, give uh, the historical context to miniature painting and uh, with a focus on Persian and uh, uh, from the miniature painting from the Indian subcontinent. And then as a practitioner of this medium myself, I would like to then talk more about the, um, the characteristics and the elements of, you know, which make this art form really special and unique. And at the end, uh, you know, I would like to show uh, contemporary examples, including my own work, given how we, uh, you know, time permits. So, um, let's see if you can go to the next slide. Yeah. So when we, uh, you know, when we talk about miniature painting um, in the context of Islamic art, we must realize that it's not necessarily an art form that depicts the teachings of the Islamic faith. Uh, or, uh, you know, uh, that, an art form that emerged with the, uh, uh, from the Arab region in the 7th century. But instead, you know, the term, uh, and probably you study it in your know, class as well, when we talk about the art of the Islamic world, it, um, it encompasses like a large uh, variety of art forms that developed um, uh, in the times or were highly patronized by, uh, in the regions where, which were under the Muslim rule. Uh, so, uh, you know, and the practitioners of these art forms, uh, and as well as the subject matter, could be of diverse faiths. So similarly, when we study the history of miniature painting, we see uh, influences of the religions that preceded Islam, uh, as well as the artistic traditions of the native, uh, uh, you know, paintings and art form uh, uh, in those regions. And uh, so therefore, inevitably, it's uh, subject to a wide range of, uh, you know, regional styles and influences, as well as it changes as, uh, you know, the uh, development of different periods. So before I get into uh, the paintings, I always like to mention the the local terminologies that describes this these uh, art form, because you know I'm of I'm from that school of thought that believe the term miniature painting comes with the Western gaze, right? If, because given the size of this work and it's kind of another way of labeling them and understanding them, but um, you know for the locals of that time it was just painting. Right. So these are the some of the terminologies in different languages, um, which describes, you know, either application of paint or painting or, uh, you know, art. So when we uh, talk about, uh, you know, miniature painting as we recognize it today, uh, so maybe from the Indian subcontinent or from, you know, the Ottoman Turkish Empire or, um, you know, other Central Asian uh, regions. Uh, we always look at the Persian history and the tradition because uh, that defines the basis of this, uh, you know, art, when you study this art form. So um, again, going, uh, you know, like going back to the term, uh, so the miniature paintings were 
historically uh, created as accompanying uh, illustrations to important manuscripts. So, you know, like handwritten illuminated manuscripts, um, which were called the Muraka. And um, so, and probably that's what gives it uh, the name miniature painting, given the size, because they were always part of a manuscript in a book form. Uh, they were not, they were always supposed to be viewed as one, uh, one manuscript, but of course now all those pages are, uh, are being dispersed and, you know, part of different museums as independent paintings. Um, so these manuscripts served, uh, you know, uh, uh, different purposes, uh, including documenting histories, literature, mythologies, uh, and different traditions. Um, uh, but uh, so the, the so the challenge for the artists was that you know within that small scale within that size they had to uh, be storytellers so they had to illustrate these uh, you know device ways of how do you uh, you know in a single image depict an entire story or an entire uh, text uh, which had so many layers in it. So, you know, the, the images that you see now on the screen are like really early examples of some of the surviving uh, manuscripts that we have. Um, so one of the important manuscripts that I would like to mention, and, you know, I mean, one can have an entire talk on it, is the uh, is Ferdowsi's uh, Shahnameh, right, the, uh, the Book of the Kings. And so it was, um, so Ferdowsi created this book. Uh, you know, at the towards the end of uh, the 10th century, it is the most uh, important piece of literature in Persian history, uh, because uh, uh, at the time, Fedosi was one of the intellectuals, which at the time when, uh, you know, there was a uh, uh, Muslim invasion on Persia, they wanted to preserve their own uh, traditions and cultures and language uh, and, the, you know, the rich Persian history before the before the new rulers. And the way to do it is, um, uh, you know, uh, Abul Qasim Firdausi wrote his uh, incredible poem, the Shahnameh, which is uh, the world's largest poem. And it is, uh, it comprises of 50,000 couplets. And what it does, it, it documents the entire history of, uh, you know, uh, uh, the Persian history through my, uh, so which is divided into like the mythology, the, um, the heroic and the historic. So, um, I mean, I would highly encourage students to, you know, research the Chaname, read about it, find out its details, because it gives you a completely different window to see the, uh, you know, understand the Persian people and how rich their uh, history and how superior the artistic traditions and literature were. Um, so anyway, so some of the, uh, you know, so that, uh, was one of a very important manuscript that got illustrated at that time. Of course, none of the original, uh, you know, pages of that man originals have survived. But the Shahnameh has been reproduced multiple times through different periods in history. Um, so uh, I would actually uh, go to the next slide because the the next uh, big chapter of the development of. Uh, Persian miniature is comes during the empire of the Safavid uh, dynasty, which uh, you know over two hundred years, uh, uh, this the the Safavids controlled large parts of what is today Iran and Azerbaijan, and they were actively commissioning uh, you know building public architecture, mosques, and they were very very invested in the uh, illuminated uh, manuscripts. So I chose. Um, basically three important artists from uh, the Safavid period, uh, Kamaluddin Behzad, uh, Mir Ali Husseini, and uh, Riza Abbasi. And I would use these paintings to actually talk about, uh, you know, breaking them down and talk about the elements of miniature painting. So one thing to note is they uh, were, uh, um, they were, they were highly stylized. It's an highly stylized art form. So it's not, the way uh, through really simple lines, uh, you know, complex imagery comes through. So, uh, so unlike, I mean, there is this misconception that maybe, you know, they, they're not realistically done or they're not, uh, you know, they're, they're not, so they're naturalistic, but stylized. So I, I feel these artists were really, you know, progressive and experimental for their time. Um, and this, uh, you know, this, uh, 
their skill set was really amazing. So one thing to note is the the um, you know simple straight lines and unbroken lines were used to for drawing um, uh, figures. Figures were uh, you know highly stylized uh, and um, uh, one. So we could also see here, uh, you know, um, because of the Mongol invasion, uh, we see influences of Chinese art in uh, in uh, some of the early miniatures, or you know, for a long time. Um, the other thing, uh, really uh, uh, important to see, is the application of color. So. Uh, most of these paintings, uh, we do not like. We see uh, the color appearing flat. We do not see shadows, um, or, or you know how we now understand painting through shading and so. But but these this the flat application of color is actually built in layers. So uh, so although it appears that it's like uh, you know like a flat application, but it is the flat areas that take the longest to make. Uh, compared to the decorative elements of uh, of these painting, because to achieve the flatness, each area is built stroke by stroke in layers. Another important uh, aspect of these painting is the uh, you know the idea which I mentioned earlier, the idea of storytelling. Uh, so within one frame, the artist would devise met methods to uh, to address different uh, chapters within one uh, painting. So, for example, and to do that, one of the devices used was perspective. Uh, what we see is uh, they, you know, something that can be called like a piled up perspective. So, for example, in this one painting uh, on, uh, you know, the first image that you see, you see an entire house, the outside of the house and, you know, different rooms piled up on top of each other to show the depth uh, of the, uh, the entire building. Uh, it is situated in, and uh, the w one thing that the uh, Persian used a lot is is geometric patterns to 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 um, you know to set like in this particular painting to separate the perspective and the different areas of that uh, room. Uh, the uh, although this these paintings would accompany text, but what we also see uh, in them is the text becoming part of the painting itself. So the uh, you know that was another uh, like a compositional element to incorporate calligraphy into uh, the work itself as a design element. So a lot of these paintings would also uh, be not actually created in isolation by one artist, and that is where these uh, studio setups were made. So these, so so what would happen is like in uh, the uh, the rulers or the you know they would establish these court studios, uh, which would be part of the uh, you know the royal court here, and uh, so where artists would be trained from like a really early age in a in a workshop manner. And each uh, piece of uh, painting is, has actually been worked on by multiple artists. Maybe there would be some who would be just responsible uh, to, um, you know, to grinding the paint. And uh, maybe some of uh, some artists were just, uh, you know, while learning, learning to bake a brush first before they're even allowed to, you know, uh, graduate to becoming uh, applying the color. And uh, so it was like a workshop process, um, uh, and probably the the master artist would come at the end and you know do the finishing uh, lines. Uh, but again, these because of the patronage they received and you know the the rigorous training, uh, these were really you know if you had to be really exceptionally good to be part of these studios, and we can uh, see that. Uh, one thing to note in uh, the the painting in the middle is also we see application, uh, especially in the Persian application of gold and silver, uh, in in the painting. So uh, you know, so they're actually uh, gilding uh, within the work either through uh, um, you know like a flat gold application or at times uh, you see it as a you know like a spread spread out as in the first painting. 
I would talk about more elements as you know through different slides, so we can uh, keep uh, going. So uh, I just wanted to bring this painting, uh, you know, uh, forward as it is, um, you know, the one of the most celebrated painting uh, uh, of this time, uh, the Court of uh, Keomers, and it's I, I believe it's at the Al Khan Museum uh, in Toronto. So. Uh, this painting, uh, uh, you know, depicts uh, like uh, Kemers is one of the first, like a mythological uh, king, uh, saying the first king who uh, who um, basically set up the civilization, and and the, what the and it is uh, from the Shahnameh. Uh, so basically, this is like 500 years after the actual Firdosi Shahnameh was uh, written. So what uh, we see here is like what an ideal king should be. Uh, that's what is, uh, you know, that's what Firdosi presented. So in, I mean, you don't see the detail of this painting at the moment, but like they, 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 the, the, the people in the paintings are of different, you know, skin colors and features. So in a way showing how, you know, diversity can survive together and how even the animals in this painting are shown in harmony. So basically teaching how, you know, a good ruler should establish his uh, kingdom. And um, so there were, you know, I mean, given when this was created and how, you know, this, this, you can spend hours in front of this one painting. It is so rich in tradition and there's so many layers of, uh, you know, to enjoy in it. Um, what another thing that you do not see that the artist has actually hidden faces in these colorful mountains and landscape uh, in this painting. Um, yeah, this is another one that I wanted to uh, pull out uh, from, uh, you know, the Safavid period is it's a court's night scene, um, you know, of a court. And um, it's again, another painting that pulls you in and, you know, there's so much to see in it and the details is immense. I mean, for example, so what it shows is just uh, one day or one evening in an urban life. So, and so basically it's not illustrating a particular, you know, prince or king or mythology at all, but it just shows you uh, like the secular art in the Muslim society, right? So it's just uh, a scene of a street, um, what you see here is actually three sections. Uh, there is the interior uh, where there is court happening. There are dancers, musicians, and uh, you know, a king enjoying his time. At the same time, there is this line of street scenes. So there are vendors, there are shops, and different people having conversation. And then this probably is the interior where you see women, uh, you know, enjoying probably some meal or talking to each other. And so there's, you know, so. Again, the, the device of how architectural and you know, geometry and patterning is used in this painting to create that, uh, you know, that element of storytelling within one, one form. And then, of course, as you can see, this, there is a lot of emphasis on decoration. Uh, and, and the Persians were really, really keen on how, you know, using... Uh, patterns on dresses and, you know, the, the richness of colors and the palette was really specific, um, you know, the, the, uh, the pattern on carpets uh, and, and so forth. So now if we come to the other side and we talk a little bit about the, uh, you know, the history of uh, Indian miniature painting. So I wanted to again start with some of the older uh, examples. So these are uh, you know, examples of earlier miniature paintings in India, which can be traced back to the uh, you know, 7th century, uh, when they flourished under the uh, patronage of the palas of Bengal. And uh, so a lot of Buddhist texts and scriptures were illustrated on palm leaf uh, manuscripts and, uh, you know, uh, and the mythologies and stories of Buddha and, uh, you know, uh, uh, and other religions. Uh, so uh, again, you see a completely different uh, palette of colors because of the region we're talking about now. They're more earth colors of, uh, you know, the, uh, you see these rich reds and the yellows and the, you know, colors from uh, like turmeric and different air minerals found in that region. 
but when we want to study uh, you know the established and the advanced uh, the miniature paintings that we recognize now we uh, look at uh, you know how, where it really thrived and that is when the uh, mughal uh, rulers were uh, were ruling india uh, i just i just want to mention the uh, you know the the uh, the uh, the kings uh, so Babur was the first Mughal king, but his, you know, during his time, it was mostly, which is like a short period, was mostly about, you know, conquering and getting as much area under uh, his reign uh, in that. Um, but it is actually when his son Humayun was ruling is um, he went into a 15 year, 14 year exile uh, into Persia from India. And that is when he was exposed to, uh, you know, Persian miniature painting uh, and was completely in awe of it. So when he returned back to India, he brought with him master painters from, uh, from uh, you know, Persia. And then he copied that model uh, of uh, court studios uh, in, in, his, in his court. And... Um, and started commissioning Hamza Nama, like uh, you know the the tales of Amir Hamza. So so basically they uh, they for them you know the earlier Mughal kings were not really um, attached to the you know the the local history and the local art and uh, so they they basically brought their you know they, they imported the uh, art of the Persian to India, but uh, and so the 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 uh, the manuscript that they commissioned were all, uh, you know, from uh, what they experienced, like the like Hamza Nama again, like the Persian manuscripts. Um, but it's 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 later when they settle in, and you you have the third Mughal king Akbar. Uh, he uh, he reigned the longest, and uh, he was more uh, you know secular in terms of, and he was more adaptive and in you know to the local. Uh, uh, climate and, you know, the local uh, art of India. And he even uh, introduced a new religion called Deen Elahi. So he brought together, uh, you know, Islam, Hinduism and uh, Christianity uh, to uh, to thrive together uh, because, you know, I guess he was smart to see how that would really impact his uh, popularity and he could really benefit from uh, that. So when we study, you know, architecture and art from his period, we see a lot of influences come in. Um, so he commissioned three, uh, you know, four major uh, manuscripts, Hamza Nama. He continued working on Hamza Nama that was started by Humayun. And then, of course, then he, he also commissioned the Ramayan illustration of, you know, like Hindu goddesses. So I pulled two examples from... Uh, uh, you know, works from his time. And now, again, what we see here is if you notice and you look carefully, we still, like in this work, uh, although it's like a story of uh, Krishna holds up the mound, uh, the mountain to shelter the villagers. Again, completely from, uh, you know, a story from the Hindu mythology of Krishna story. But if you notice the the, the uh, you know, the mountains are still painted in the Persian style and, uh, you know, you see the, 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 the Persian blue coming into it, the way uh, some of the, uh, you know, uh, the foliage, the trees are drawn is still influenced, uh, much influenced by the Persian style. And these, um, what we, so we do see a thematic shift happening though. And uh, another thing to notice is that, uh, you know, the, the facial expressions or the facial uh, type is shifting because now, you know, the artists are seeing uh, what, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're getting more acquainted with the local uh, style of painting. And of course, then, uh, although he brought the master painters are from Persia, but a lot of local artists joined those courts and learned uh, this art form. So the the uh, the kings that followed after is uh, we have Jahangir, uh, 
and his um, uh, the paintings that we see in his time were mostly uh, of well, he was more interested in nature so of course the art uh, the painters favor the what the taste of the ruler is who's paid, you know who's who's commissioning the work um and so we see a lot of work that has you know amazing studies of birds and flowers uh, come out uh, during his time uh, then Shah Jahan, uh, though his uh, the, the king that followed him was more interested in architecture. So yes, he, we do see the Taj Mahal in his time. But at the same time, even if we observe the paintings that were made in this time, there there really we see an emphasis on architectural elements within those work. After Shah Jahan, uh, we see a, a gradual decline um, in. Uh, the court paintings and uh, miniature painting because a Aurangzeb was more um, uh, more uh, conservative uh, religiously uh, and at the same time uh, there was a lot of unrest within India there was uh, you know because of course there were so many states within India uh, away from their capital that were ruled by different Rajputs and you know different kings and there, there were always constant battles within and the unrest. And eventually this unrest and you know the, resulted in the uh, the British taking over uh, the uh, you know uh, Indian subcontinent and colonizing it. Um, and that is also again uh, uh, an event you know and we see another style of painting emerge with that. So I wanted to pull uh, two paintings from uh, uh, from Jahangir's time, um, sorry, Shah Jahan's time, uh, and uh, and now you can clearly observe the differences between you know the paintings that we saw Persian miniature in the Safavid period when they were at their peak, and this is when miniature painting, Indian miniature painting, was at its peak. Uh, the the features the they have completely shifted very you know Indian looking uh, features we see and uh, the uh, the the color palette has changed uh, as well as uh, the subject matter I guess the, so the, the Mughals were more interested in documenting their the reign right their 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 own grandeur they uh, their the you know, the way they ruled. Uh, and we can see that depicted in a lot of the art. So the use of gold is a lot uh, more prominent in some of these. I'll let you enjoy these works as well while they're on the screen and before shifting. Uh, another thing element that is pretty common in many uh, miniature paintings, uh, historical, is the use of how, how scale is used to show uh, status. So the kings would always be drawn larger than the commoners, uh, and you know painted uh, uh, more intricately and more detailed. Another important uh, aspect of uh, miniature painting are their borders. So uh, as they were part of uh, of manuscripts, there was this element of border around the painting, and at times that border became as important as the painting itself and there could you know there are some many in fact examples where an entire painting exists within the just within the borders or a diff, you know an, an entire story could be within a, a border of a completely different painting and uh, so these would range these borders would range from uh, you know arabesque to geometric to uh, as you can see in this one completely uh, uh, you know, natural and uh, with flowers and birds and animals in them. So uh, when, uh, you know, like with, especially with the decline of uh, the studio paintings, uh, the, the studios in the court, what we see is uh, a lot of artists fled the capital and and would go into you know the places they came from or the villages or settle in different uh, regions of India. And once they do that, they we see uh, you know the, the the rajas or the maharajas or the kings or the smaller kings of those areas would establish their own uh, studios and patronize or you know establish patronage for these artists. 
and uh, and that becomes a really, really interesting time because you see a variety of uh, styles emerge within miniature painting because of that um, and so so for each like you know for each region or each province we see different artistic elements emerge and these are just i just pulled uh, you know some examples here together so you can compare as well like for example uh, a painting in Krishn, Krishnagar would show a portrait you know, with elongated eyes, pointed nose, a very typical way of them uh, doing uh, portraiture. Whereas if we look at uh, paintings in the south, which is Dakkan, we see uh, the painting would be, the face would be three quarters, never a profile, um, in the features are changed. Um, and then when we look uh, at the painting on your extreme, uh, the one below from Jodhpur uh, in the Pahari school, uh, a very different palette, you know, very few uh, colors. Uh, and at the same time, you see the uh, uh, really interesting play of scale here, how, you know, the, the, the king who is out hunting is shown the largest. And depending on the status of each of the people in the painting, they change. And probably these are the, the ones who were carrying his carriage were the least important. Uh, and similarly, you know, the, when we look at the Pahari school, the northern area, the, because they were the followers of, uh, you know, Krishna and uh, uh, Rama and Sita. So, so, so basically, the subject also changed based on which uh, region uh, we look at. The one at the very bottom here is from uh, a style of, uh, you know, school of paint, miniature painting called the Company. Which is when, which was during the British rule, and now we see that immediately when uh, a because of the time period, we uh, we uh, you know the influences came from the West as well. So now the the you see the form, the simp, you know the stylization has shifted to more realistic, and you see uh, shadows and you know uh, it's more three, the three dimensionality of it is more important now, as well as uh, the subject matter, of course. And, uh, and also, you know, and through after this, the, the um, photography was also invented, right? And that changed a lot of things for, uh, for the art and painting itself, because, you know, with the advent of, like coming of photography and other ways of documenting and uh, printmaking, so uh, there is a constant decline in the art of, uh, you know, it could take you so long to produce. I mean, these paintings could take months, uh, if not years, to complete, right? So, uh, and after, so basically after the pa partition and, uh, you know, we, or even before that, what, ended up happening is uh, the there was a, a decline on uh, the appreciation or the patronage of this art form and what that did was um, it uh, brought it to a point that where, where artists were there but they were just reproducing paintings that had already been done so they were just replicas being reproduced of what was popular and what would sell and and uh, and to date, that is the trend that we see often. Like if you, you know, if some of you have been to India or you go there, you just, you see loads of artists, you know, uh, uh, sitting on roadsides and just selling you replicas of uh, miniature painting. So, so it became more of, uh, you know, the status from where it was, it became, came to that point where it's just considered like a craft or, uh, you know, uh, to be, uh, reproducing of the old miniatures only and that uh, it's and it is only in um, in the late uh, uh, like in in the 90s that we see a change in that and i'll come to that briefly but i just wanted to bring show this one uh, which is one of my favorite jodhpur painting uh, is uh, is this uh, the raja of jodhpur is celebrating a festival in his uh, palace. And what I love about this painting is that that one Raja is shown within one painting in multiple places. So here you see the outside of his court, but then you also see the inside. And here he's sitting with one, you know, surrounded by ladies and enjoying 
uh, an evening here. Here he's playing a game of Chaucer with another group of ladies. Then he's on the swing. Then later he takes court and addresses uh, musicians and singers and dancers. Again, another group of ladies. And then he goes out in the forest to have, uh, you know, some. So it's just he's having, a, I think, a really great time <laughs> in this painting. And at the, uh, you know, we see him. Uh, interestingly, again, the same thing I was talking about, the perspective that we see him really on the rooftop as well and all within that same frame. So as I mentioned that uh, much uh, later, uh, we see a, a new shift take place like in early 19, 1990s, uh, the art school that I went to, uh, the National College of Arts, we, um, uh, I mean, there were, there was uh, in the visual arts department, there was a, a uh, like a, uh, um, a department of miniature painting along with, you know, traditional painting, printmaking, sculptures like all visual arts schools have. But what was it, uh, what was happening was for years, again, as I mentioned, our um, students were just uh, asked or to, to reproduce uh, master paintings. But it was um, in the uh, 19, you know, 89 or 90, when a group of uh, professors thought or uh, came up with the idea that what if we, we, we contemporize this department, right? Because if you look at the history, the artists we just, uh, examples we just saw, those artists were completely contemporary, right? They were painting the court scenes or commissioned by the artists who were the kings who were actually there and you know they they painted what they saw so why aren't we not doing the same now and it is the art form that belongs to this region which has its history its roots and you know uh, uh, to that so i think once they decided that they started it as an experiment of okay so we do keep the tradition alive by learning it the traditional way we do the we use the same um, elements and the materials, but what if the students are asked to learn it and then uh, have their own voice in this same medium, like keeping the rules of the medium? So that is when we see contemporary miniature painting coming out of South Asia uh, and particularly Pakistan. <clears throat> and uh, so what I wanted to show here is the uh, uh, a typical setup of how a miniature painting studio and an artist would look like. Uh, and so we sit on the floor, like now when I say we is because I'm part of this group of uh, artists who practice this medium. So we uh, would normally uh, sit on the floor to paint. We do not take our shoes into the studio to show respect uh, to, uh, you know, to that area that we, uh, to our studio. And the reason you sit on the floor and, you know, with your back and bring the painting to you rather than like you do an easel or, you know, easel painting, you stand and you paint is because miniature painting would take a much longer time to make. So you need to be extremely comfortable. And by bringing the, uh, the painting to you, you're not straining your neck or your eyes and your eyesight um, as well. And of course, it's so what because of the patience required and the time required and the skill required in this medium, you it becomes like an entire discipline of your body um, and mind. Uh, you need to really focus on 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 the tip of your brush to make those intricate lines. Uh, the slide here is uh, we make uh, prepare our own paper called Wasli, which is done in exactly like it was done in the you know traditional way, is by uh, joining layers of uh, sh drawing sheets together to make it archival, and then there is a layer of uh, this handmade uh, binder on top of on the top layer as well, and then it's eventually polished and uh, a, a smooth surface is created, which helps the brush to uh, move easily. Some artists still use, uh, I mean, we do have, uh, you know, nice pigment, uh, natural pigments available now in art stores that we use, but at the same time, we uh, uh, make our own colors as well. And one thing you would have noticed is uh, in the previous paintings as well, is that they, um, the application of color is uh, opaque. So they're not, although it's water-based color, but they're not uh, transparent. And to do that, uh, as, uh, 
a medium is created, uh, which is mixed in every color that we uh, use, um, which is called sofeda, which is basically pure zinc white that get mixed in every color to give it its opacity. As well as even if you're painting black, we start making that color with white. Uh, artists back then and even today, we use shells as our palettes, and it is was an extremely genius uh, way of uh, uh, storing your color. Because uh, one thing is that it's cheap, it's easily accessible. Uh, plus, for each color, you use a different shell. So in a way, and every time you need a new color, you just get another shell, and you not uh, you don't need to wash it off. Uh, so for a painting that's going to last you months, you need you know your your color is saved. Uh, uh, I and other artists like myself, we make our own brush, which is called the kalam, and it is important to do so even now because uh, there is no brush in the market available that can draw a fine line needed uh, that we need in uh, doing miniature painting. Um, so we use squirrel hair and, uh, you know, through a process, we make these brushes ourselves. And these brushes, the entire painting is not done by these single hair brushes, but uh, it's the fine lines and the final detailing that is done through these. Uh, I wanted to show some of the, uh, like, like portfolio work from uh, when you're studying in this department, uh, you, you, you study the different uh, uh, um, styles of painting, which uh, is Seya Kalam, is when you're just working with black and white ink and drawing uh, with that. And then Neem Rang means semi-color, which is uh, transparent washes. Uh, and Gadrang is like a full uh, paint, uh, painted uh, image with opaque colors. So students would be asked to, uh, you know, first copy painting from each school, like a painting, their portfolio must have a painting from the Mughal school, the, the Pahari, the Persian, and the teachers, or, you know, it, it's, uh, it's believed that that's the best way to understand and learn these traditional paintings, because unless you've done them and you do them, you don't really understand how, what goes into uh, making them. And after like a good portfolio uh, is created of uh, replicating these, we end up, uh, we're asked to do paintings of, uh, you know, our own uh, compositions. So I just pulled out some, uh, you know, student portfolios. Uh, probably these artists are now, uh, you know, established painters themselves. But I just wanted to give examples that some of the early paintings done are where you, you know, you, uh, uh, Students end up borrowing uh, imagery from the tradition and then placing, you know, uh, uh, themselves or uh, whatever they wanted to paint, the figures or friends within those uh, uh, stories. So I wanted to, I wish I had time to show a lot more uh, contemporary work of other artists, but I just want to uh, uh, point out two artists here. One is a really celebrated artist, Shazia Sikandar, living in the US, and probably most of you uh, have uh, must have heard of her or seen her work. She is uh, really contributed, uh, you know, uh, uh, she, her biggest contribution is that she brought uh, the Western focus to the, the contemporary miniature uh, uh, movement happening in Pakistan, and that is uh, because she she came to the U.S. for her master's and she continues to live in New York. And uh, so basically she, uh, you know, her work became the, uh, brought attention uh, to the school that I mentioned and uh, the, uh, and the artists that followed uh, her footsteps. Um, another important artist is Imran Qureshi that I'm showing here. Uh, I would highly encourage students to look up these artists and see their work. I just was able to share one of his uh, work here. Is What he does is these large installations where he um, splashes uh, paint on the ground and then he goes in and intricately paints uh, the, the Kangra foliage that onto these uh, splashes. Uh, individually and, uh, you know, again, both of them, uh, you know, have, of course, uh, political narrative. Uh, Shazia talks a lot about feminism and uh, other aspects. 
I just wanted to show a few more examples. Uh, uh, the reason I pull, uh, you know, other than that I like their work, Saira Vaseem, again, based in US, uh, she, uh, you know, highly skillful uh, in, in the style of painting, but I, I, her, her work also follows the traditions idea of, uh, you know, more, uh, like, like more clearly illustrative uh, in terms of her concern. Um, whereas when we see, uh, when, when we see this work, which is by Khadim Ali, now based in Australia, he, um, his own heritage is, uh, he is from the Afghan uh, background, uh, you know, living as a refugee in Pakistan, and now he's moved to Australia. So he draws a lot from the Persian history to comment on the current politics of uh, his, the, uh, you know, the uh, war on Afghanistan. Uh, Nusra Latif is another artist who's based in uh, Australia, and I just wanted to her work is talks a lot about post-colonialism and uh, aspects of uh, that. Uh, and this is I wanted to bring this out because she's she's incorporated digital manipulation within miniature painting. Uh, so you see her own portrait uh, superimposed on different uh, rulers and kings and queens, Western and South Asian. And there's there's a lot of experimentation that's happening uh, in uh, contemporary miniature painting that I would encourage everybody to look at. And I wish I could show most of it here, but I cannot. So I'll um, get into uh, my own work uh, a little bit. So I wanted to start with the um, uh, with a project that I did. Um, uh, with uh, my uh, partner artist uh, Faisal Anwar, who's a new media artist. So what we did was uh, I uh, came up with the idea of creating a tableau vivant of uh, miniature painting. Like tableau vivant is the French tradition, I'm pretty sure all of you know, where you bring a painting to life. Uh, and uh, so I wanted to do that with the with a miniature painting and see like how two histories of art practices would come together. So what I did is I selected this uh, uh, this uh, uh, this painting of uh, from the Mahabharata of um, of Draupadi's uh, mythology, and I uh, broke it into a live performance, and uh, which incorporated video, uh, live video manipulation, recorded video, as well as live performances and uh, live musicians. And so what what I did was the the uh, uh, we collaborated with an art school in Pakistan where uh, um, visual artist students of the third year, we worked together for a period of a month and uh, it became like a karkana, like a miniature painting workshop where different students were assigned different tasks. Some were responsible for the costumes, some for the video, some for creating the, uh, I mean, you can say the painting or the set of it. and. Um, and then what we did was they were to uh, reenact the painting, but not move, like hold postures. Uh, and with live music, you can imagine like there's these figures which are real, but are still. And so for, for at least a period of five minutes or say, so, they will hold a pose and then very gradually they would change the, the pose. So it became like a mesmerizing experience for the audience. And I did the uh, similar uh, project in Canada as well, where I worked with two groups of uh, artists run centers. Uh, and one of them focuses uh, is SAVAC, which focuses on South Asian visual arts collect center, which focuses on diaspora artists from the South Asia. So we partnered with, with another a gallery uh, and we chose two different paintings. One from a Western tradition, the famous, uh, you know, Pregnard's The Swing, and uh, one painting from the Kangra tradition. And uh, so basically what I wanted to explore was that, you know, what is the dialogue that happens when you bring two very different, distinct art histories in one space, uh, and artists who are informed by very different art uh, understanding and um, understanding of mediums. So this time what we did through a process of workshop, we broke it into sections. We broke both paintings into sections and we divided it into a gallery space, opened it up and, uh, and audiences were allowed to move in the space. 
So from one area of the painting, they could go into the other area of the painting and, and so forth. And of course, what you don't see here is there, there is live music and contemporary music. So, you know, so there were these, it was like a full collaborative project. Uh, the image that I'm most, my work is most recognized by is that of a cockroach. And, uh, and for quite a few years now, since 2002, I have been incorporating the image of a cockroach in my work. Uh, and for me, what and it's mostly painted dead, and it is uh, it stands in for the diminishing value of uh, human life, uh, and uh, through you know the through our environment today and war driven environment, and how we devalue human life and uh, uh, we where we treat you know it's we treat them as that of an insect. Uh, and so what I do is I, uh, I paint repeatedly uh, an image of a dead cockroach in multiple art and I borrow the language of entomology museums because I feel um, archival practices parallel uh, political propaganda and, uh, and you know and that is uh, so what I do is I mim literally mimic them where I get scientific you know three-dimensional pins and labels and but the the uh, the surface is painted again uh you know although it's it's completely contemporary uh, in terms of medium but maybe you can see that how each one of these cockroaches is drawn uh they're not digital uh, and i use that same you know the single hair brush and i there is no margin of error in it it's painted directly on white surface and then after painting them i pierce pins into it to uh, show as if they're uh, uh, collected and categorized. Uh, so similarly, again, another painting to show uh, from the same series where, you know, when we go to museums, we have these, uh, um, you know, uh, objects or figures or imagery pulled open for investigation. So that's what my uh, is happening with my cockroach in this painting. And uh, I like the idea of, you know, when you uh, Again, archival practices, we, we, when we go to these museums, we are really keen on reading what the label says, right? The idea. So in a way, you know, that's how I feel uh, media functions as well. Like there is certain stories that are told to you in certain ways and that become your reality and, you know, how history gets written. Uh, not necessarily it's always the truth. Um, and uh, so, so. In this painting, it draws people in, and uh, when they come in and want to read the label, all it says is red or hair. And, uh, you know, again, a dual play here because red or the color of the skin or the type of your hair is how you would recognize cultures or label them or, um, you know, categorize them. So again, using uh, the, co the cockroach as my object is uh, really symbolic to the idea of how uh, you know, how it's universally feared and considered gross, right? And uh, not necessarily the most dangerous uh, insect on the planet. But again, you know, how we fear um, cultures we don't understand or people we don't uh, relate to. And I, so that's where this uh, comes into play. So just another example. I mean, there's a lot of uh, uh, depth in these paintings, but I can see we're uh, sort of running short of time, so I'll go a little quick. Um, so I use cryptic, like I create these labels based on my research and, uh, you know, the, the what I'm addressing. Um, and a lot of my titles comes from pesticide labels, like may irritate eyes or keep away from the reach of children. Again, uh, you know, humorously playing uh, with my political commentary. And at certain point, this the motif of the cockroach becomes uh, in, from dead, it becomes alive as well. So basically, the idea of fear remains central in my work um, uh, and through this. And again, there is a play of uh, by painting them really intricately and beautifully. I'm, I'm drawing the audience in and there is a play of repulsion and grotesque and beauty coming together uh, in these works. Uh, in this particular painting, I took quotes from uh, four different leaders, like then President uh, of U.S. Obama, a uh, quote from the Pakistani Prime Minister and President, and a Taliban uh, spokesperson. And what I did is I removed their names. 
So if you see the work, you cannot identify who sa who's saying what. Uh, another project that I wanted to show was uh, a commission project for the airport, Toronto Pearson Airport. I was, uh, you know, when I was asked to do a project there, I, it became like, I was really excited because the airport itself is a very important site. Uh, you know, when you talk about, uh, you know, the political investigation that I do is, uh, you know, for many of us since, uh, you know, after 9-11 and after the heightened security measures, going through an airport security is like a, uh, you know, a traumatic experience at times too. And, you know, the, the, the amount of security checks and the surveillance. And so, so I wanted my work to speak to that because now it's in that space. So I created this project, which is through, uh, you know, uh, a, uh, several months of uh, research, uh, of photo photo photographic research at the airport that I'm, I'm not uh, adding here, but you can, uh, you know, uh, look at it separately. Uh, so eventually what turned out was I created this grid uh, like pattern out of cut out cockroaches. So each one is individually cut and placed. Uh, they are done in acrylic. And then uh, so it creates like this, uh, this beautiful jali or like a screen, which is also present in, you know, you see uh, in Islamic architecture or, in, you know, the patterning in miniature painting, in Persian paintings. Um, and uh, Within this installation, I had uh, these chairs painted in the Mughal style of, um, um, you know, so so kind of depicting royalty and beauty. Uh, and, you know, for me, these chairs uh, speak to this in-between space, right? Because when you're at the airport, you, you, you use these spaces momentarily, you know, for a limited time between two journeys, like from and to. And so I kind of see it as like this in-between place that I see myself as into, right? Between living between these two cultures, and uh, you know, you really don't know what the journey holds for you next. Uh, then these are some other examples of uh, uh, you know installations that I've created using the same imagery of the cockroach. Uh, again, these are created on site, and this one is about like eight feet in diameter and each one of them is individually placed and not stuck. Then I, uh, you know, after a while I start, when I do installations, I start craving my painting again. And I, so I take these imagery back into my studio and, um, uh, you know, create paintings. Uh, so over, like, again, in this one, like, as you can see that the, the cockroach, the image of the cockroach itself has been changed. Now it's just these outline of the bodies and, uh, you know, creating these intricate patterns within a painting. And uh, so, you know, so I'm kind of taking pleasure in, in simplifying yet making it extremely intricate and detailed and pulling the uh, viewer inside it. Again, each one of them is, in, you know, painted with hand and not digitally uh, created. Another part of my practice is these uh, text-based performances that I do uh, and drawings, uh, where I choose a phrase uh, and in public spaces or in gallery settings, I create these uh, live performances, which could be, and where I'm drawing that one phrase repeatedly, and it could be uh, like a two hours or a three hours duration. Uh, of performance and um, where now my body becomes as much important like as part much part of the piece uh, as the what I am writing so in this instance I chose a phrase uh, which says we do not know who we are where we go it's originally from uh, another project book project that I did with an Italian uh, poet Nani Balestrini and it's from his Italian poem that this phrase comes from but again it speaks to the larger context of you know, it could be political, social, religious, however you want to understand this phrase. At times I do these in streets and, uh, you know, where the uh, audience can stand and, you know, uh, it's not always a gallery setting. Then I bring this practice into my studio as well, uh, where I create these large uh, drawings. Again, just building it stroke word by word. Uh, and most of the time now I choose a single word. It's not even a phrase. And these words are, uh, uh, you know, 
uh, carefully selected. Uh, they're poetic. They're all you know always in Urdu or Persian, and uh, based on uh, in the concepts and the meaning. And now what this has done is it's become brought my you know like my outward social and political commentary more inward because now this process is very much more like a meditation right it's just based on uh, this immense uh, uh, challenging the body plus repetition where it's uh, i need to be completely focused and asking or talking to myself or if one believes in the higher being right it's just uh, it becomes like a meditative process so uh, for example in this work that you see i've uh, written uh, two uh, words together uh, the the word for uh, right and the word for wrong so basically uh, you know what and each band with each band it's uh, i'm writing one word clockwise and then i turn and write the other word anti clockwise again uh, talking about how we're you know we're always stuck in the in the loop of wrong and right right that's these are two inseparable concepts that define how we live our life what are you know how we define our ethics and how do we live this is just a close up of uh, this work so this is about uh, this work is like a good 5 feet uh, uh, long and completely covered in these uh, in this text uh this one is a more uh, i mean there are quite a few in the series uh, of course i couldn't show all of them here this is the most uh, one of the most recent drawings uh, in that series and this happened like you know uh, the past summer when we saw a lot of uh, protest uh, the blm uh, protests uh, recently and each one of us i mean uh, you can understand was emotionally charged and invested and you know affected by it all and i was Uh, and we saw a lot of organization and institutions you know issuing statements and uh, uh, online and uh, about black life matters and uh, you know talking about equality and privilege and i was you know one would took a step back to examine what does it really mean like what is what is this how you know all of a sudden we are all talking about it but how have how have we incorporated it in our lives what do we actually do and so i just created this work so i could spend time with each of this word uh, and uh, you know think about it so basically repetition and writing gives me another way of understanding another way of talking you know and expressing myself and having a dialogue within so i just wanted to uh, show this one uh, work which is uh, again a drawing performance uh, but it was recorded so a video could be uh, created from it Uh, so in this, I'm writing the word "khayal," which means care, and uh, you know, more than ever, uh, you know, the time we're living in now after COVID, this word resonates the most, because you know, uh, what if anything, COVID has made us realize that uh, we need to uh, slow down and uh, you know, take time to care, care for the environment, care for ourselves, care for each other. and uh you know and that realization i think it's really important uh um, more than ever now so i would like to and this is how this uh, video was presented um uh, uh, in in a very busy intersection of toronto so i would like to end it here thank you so much to zin it is a pleasure to hear um about the the background of you know the the works the historic um imagery and then see how that really follows through um into the contemporary work of your colleagues and yourself thank you so much um i know we are a little bit over time does anyone have any questions out there for tasin uh, about any of the topics she covered today um about older um miniature painting i was wondering if, is it like primarily Does it primarily focus on people, or are there cases of like landscape art with it, or something like that? Yeah, no, there's there's predominantly the figure was there, and actually, it's I'm I'm glad you brought it up because there is also this uh, myth that you know the figure uh, and animal form are prohibited in Islam. but that you know when you study miniature painting you realize that it's just it's uh, it's not completely true 
uh, and uh, there has been representation of figure throughout uh, you know the art of islam um, and uh, so predominantly yes because the, there were figures but no we do have uh, really important paintings which were purely studies of you know particular birds and particular plants or flowers or uh, uh, you know even insects so uh, uh, yeah there was you mentioned squirrel hair there is a few studies of squirrels i believe in in the mughal period too so maybe it was just like yeah you know, seeing the squirrel hair and <laughs> yeah no it's really important and uh, that was used to be a challenge when i was in school right a to uh, how do you make your own brush and you had to catch your squirrel first so that was <laughs> part of our training to do so but uh, i mean yeah i mean there is uh, there is so much that uh, you know, I wasn't able to cover in this uh, talk, and uh, there's uh, so much to learn from the tradition. Um, yeah, we have a we have another question from Gina. She put it in the chat. I don't know if you're able to see the chat. She said, "I wanted to say thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today." She would like to know what's your favorite media to use when you draw um, and or paint, and then what's your least favorite in terms of the sort of media that you like to or not like to use. Uh, so my favorite, uh, I guess. So. Uh, uh, I um, it varies, right? It depends where, what, uh, what work I'm doing. I mean, uh, yeah, but mostly I think uh, the the drawing practice really, really brings me to connect with myself, and that has, uh, uh, you know, I probably at this age I am in, I, I, my focus and my connection with myself has become more important than my activism and yeah. you know being. Uh, uh out there uh, but uh so yeah i mean that varies sometimes i i enjoy my performance at times because then it it transcends and uh, you know in different ways uh, i can definitely say speak to my least favorite which i force myself to do is um, uh, uh, my uh, videos where i've used myself as a subject and it's just it just opens up uh, a part of your vulnerability, right? Is just having your own face out there, and um, um, yeah. So it, it's it's it, that's the most challenging for me when I do uh, videos which has my own body in it. Well, I think we can all sort of <laughs> relate, given all of the virtual stuff uh, we've been doing. So um, I wanted to make a quick comment. I, I thought your description of this internalized feeling in the this meditative state in the performance it it feels so interesting um that it is a live performance right it, it is fundamentally about someone else seeing it but for you as the practitioner it is so internal and so i wonder if like has there been audience response like they could they saw that in some outward representation of that internal you know life energy that's going on i i've been told multiple times that it happens mm -hmm. uh, the uh, i wish i could show a video of it too but uh, the uh, the interesting thing is that when i do these performances uh, i deliberately remove myself from that space like i am there physically but if you notice, I'm always, I have, you know, like I'm looking down, so my face is down and I put headphones and I'm listening to, uh, um, you know, Sufi music and uh, like music that I can, you know, like focus with. So I'm, 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 I actually, there have been many uh, exhibitions where I didn't, don't even know how many people saw me, right? It's just, there's been, people can come and walk in and out or sometimes they stay there. Uh, there have been few examples where it was like a performance in a way that you know there were chairs around and people had to sit and experience it and they were there for a, for the entire hour and a half or two hours. So yeah, in that way they became I knew the audience, but most of the time I'm very removed from what is around me. But I've been told that that is evident, that is felt by the audience itself, and I think it's also interesting. Uh, you know, although I'm writing in Urdu and it's text that. A lot of my Western audience, you know, or even people who read Urdu cannot really read it when I'm drawing it because it's overlaps. And but I think it's it's transcends that it, it's not 
you know the cultures and the language it's it's the whole exercise or the the drawing that pulls people and sometimes they're just lost in the curve sometimes mm. they're fascinated by how my body moves because i even lose the sense of you know what my posture is uh, because imagine if you're drawing something for 3 hours without a break right so you so sometimes you know like my elbow is hurting so i'm stretching i'm like and i'm not aware of who's looking at me and you know Mm. so that entire experience is as much as part of the drawing as the end result wow yeah it's it's quite a uh, it's entrancing and uh we should mention you also have one behind you on your on your wall <laughs> you also have an example back there uh this piece was you know that's after the performances i i end up having these canvases <laughs> and so this one says the word sukoon which is to calm and peace Um, so I thought it's really good to have it in my studio. <laughs> yeah. During Zoom sessions, I need that calm uh, <laughs> aura. <laughs> um, uh, Blayton, I see you have a hand. Do you want to have a question? Um, I wanted to say first off, your piece battery um, is a battery, right? Um, bra. I said the, bribery. the one with the black and white, the oh, yeah, the barbary yeah. and barteria, yeah, yeah, the right. equality and privilege. Yeah. Uh, my question was: With new age media, have you had any artistic inspiration from any films and movies that incorporate mediums that you've used? That incorporate mediums that I use, or uh, like or have I? Had, uh, do you have you found any um, inspirations from like films and movies? Um, Yeah. Yeah, I think I mean every like every artist you uh, you know if you're honest with your work your inspirations is your lived experiences right so your inspiration yeah I mean if you're an avid movie watcher and if you're like you know whatever you follow it does inform what your thoughts are or your understanding is what your learning is right and uh, so yeah I mean there's um, it's hard to name any but of course there there uh, I wouldn't say movies because I I I don't watch a lot of movies but yeah I mean I think it's more uh, uh you know the the world around me right what I the media yes I would say uh, you know when you follow news those are movies in themselves right <laughs> there's a lot of fiction and so so yeah I mean the influences can be in many forms and ways and uh, Um, and I've uh, what I didn't show here is with these text works. I've even uh, created animations out of them. Uh, of course, I couldn't show them here, where the, the I've made the words actually move in an animation. Um, so another experience. That's really cool. I did so. Blayton is interested in film because that's what he's studying primarily. So I'm sure that was. <laughs> um, and and Jesus actually in the chat has a question. Um, is music important when creating live performances? Your live performance pieces, like the Tableau Vivant, do you compose the music yourself, or would you borrow a song that fits the theme of the piece? How does that work? So, for my uh, my individual performances, yes, the music that I uh, play is extremely important because it just uh, it's just a way of for me to focus, uh, and I'm. Uh, um, you know it's it just becomes like a chant or you know sometimes you need uh, uh so i so the music is there and then when i'm drawing the word i really have to say them in my head as well and that's what takes me into the meaning of it too i'm just sorry i'm going off the question a little bit here because for example if i'm writing the word habit uh, the urdu word of habit like adat so when i'm drawing it i'm naturally and i'm saying it in my head so i'm automatically thinking of all the habits that i can think of or i have or that that frustrate me or that influence me so so similarly you know when you're talking about sin or life or uh, other words like that they they have impact on you and music helps me to focus on that so in terms of the tableau vivant i um because both of the time i did it i made it like into a larger collaborative project and i worked with artists established artists who are uh, musicians so uh, the only direction i gave them was like to you know bring me give me sounds not music music like not a song so i gave them few directions that is contemporary feel the mood and you know capture 
uh, but they were the ones who came up with the, uh, the, the, the sound piece for those tableaus. And similarly, the artists who were enacting it, of course, I gave them the liberty of coming up with how they can feel comfortable with their body because, you know, they're artists in themselves. Excellent. Well, I'm so pleased that um, we've we've been able to um, ask a few questions and learn more based on different interests. So um, we'll end it there and just, you know, virtual claps. <laughs> so thank you so much again uh, to Zine for joining us today and for offering such um, important context and also discussion of your own work um, and your colleagues. So we appreciate it so much. And um, thank you for sharing. So as, as you saw, Tazine shared her Instagram in, um, in at the end. And so if you ever want to get more info, um, I think you had your website and your Instagram on there, right? Yes. And uh, and I would, uh, you know, I'm always happy to, if students want to contact me, uh, you know, separately and ask questions. Uh, I do mentor, uh, you know, uh, artists as well. So, I mean, feel free to get in touch, email me. I'm always available. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. Um, we'll end it there and uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Thank you so much to Zine. Oh, thank you.